avid readers, book nerds, or casual observers. Welcome to the Read Along, brought to you by the Lit Roundtable. I'm Anna. And I'm Joseph, and this is our Read Along of The Republic of Thieves by Scott Lynch. Hey there! Boop a boo! <laughs> Welcome to week nine! Part nine! The finale of The Republic of Thieves. Um, today we read chapters 11, 12, and the epilogue. But, mm-hmm. before we get into our discussion, um, our next read-along book is A Magic Steeped in Poison by Judy I. Lynn. So, um, make sure you have that for the next read-along, which is, of course, not the next not next week, but the following. So, mm-hmm. um, it should be really good. I'm excited. Me too. Okay. Let's wrap this baby up. Here we go. All right. Here we go. Chapter 11. Chapter 11 was called The Five-Year Game Returns. And then Mm. Intersect 4 was called Ignition, which... Mm -hmm. So many questions. Whoa. Um, Mind blown. (laughs) The the last interlude was called Thieves Prosper. And then chapter 12, The End of Old Dreams, and the epilogue was called Wings. So oh. let's let's do the interlude quick because it was short and sweet. Yeah, it was, I was really hoping happened. for a longer, yeah, I was hoping for a longer interlude, but it was just like, oh, they banged again. Okay. Uh, yeah, they didn't get caught. <laughs> yeah. We didn't get like any of the father chains, like reaction. We, yeah, we didn't get to see any like comeuppance for Mon Crane. We didn't get to see that. No. So, that's okay. So, that was the interlude. I will say that this book ends with, like... I mean, it's not a cliffhanger, but it is a cliffhanger. Oh, yeah. If you read the epilogue, it's certainly a cliffhanger. Yeah. Which, like, Like, if you don't read the epilogue, what's wrong with you? Like, it's amazing. Yeah. Idiot. Go read the epilogue. And then come back. Yeah. Um, So, anyway, chapter 11. Yep. Um, So, the end of the... The, election. Uh, election, yeah. Which didn't go the way I expected. Basically ended in a tie. Did you catch the part where Locke was explaining to Sabatha about how he sussed out Nikaros by... She said, oh, you gave them all different information to see which one was the... The mole. The mole. Which is not how it happened. Which we talked about in the last episode. How he asked them each for a location, and then which made Nikaros look like an idiot, idiot when he came and was like, "Oh yeah, the location I told you, it's been compromised." Well, he did. <laughs> he got different locations from each of them, which that's the thing that made no sense. So like Sabbath right. was right that they all had different information, and that's how he sussed it but out. But like that's not how that works, right? <laughs> no, but he speci- she specifically said, "Oh, you gave you fed them each different information." which would have been better. Like Mm -hmm. if he had fed them information and told them all that they were all getting the same information, but it's, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, it seemed like a weird editing thing where like at one point the editor was like, or I don't, I guess maybe Scott Lynch and the editor didn't catch it, but like that he had decided to do it one way and then changed his mind and forgot to fix Mm -hmm. the conversation later. I don't know. But, um, the way Sabbath has said it actually made sense as opposed to how he actually did it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that kind on of brand for her yes which kind of made me chuckle but uh yeah so i was so the guy the guy ended up like the guy that they went to talk to mm-hmm. we were trying to figure out like what was the point of that what they were trying to like bribe him for his for mm-hmm. his votes or whatever mm-hmm. it ended up being so razor thin that he he did end up going up and being like i'm an independent third party which right. made it a tie right. between the two and then him as the the sort of linchpin. So he's, he's basically turned himself into like in American politics, Mm. he basically turned himself into the vice president presiding over the Senate where he gets to break all the ties. And right. It was weird. Like, so now he has like all the power, like, wow. Yeah. But then, but what was the point of all this anyway? Because so the election ends, Locke and Jean and Sabbath, run away to a safe house because they don't know how the, Bonds Major are going to react to this tie. Yeah. Um, and then we get all this crazy intersect and... So, yeah. <laughs> everything. Let's talk about ignition. Yeah. <laughs> As I was reading, I was so confused. <laughs> Same. 
<laughs> I was like, what are they doing? Oh my gosh, they're blowing themselves up. As l uh, along with all the other Bonds Magi. But not all of specifically, them. Specifically, yeah, specifically the one that we thought was an undercover agent for mm -hmm. the Falconer's faction was actually undercover. It's a double deception. Mm -hmm. He was undercover for patients, mm -hmm. pretending to be undercover. Mm -hmm. So he, like, blew them all up. He went, yeah. like, suicide bomber and killed them all. Yeah. Including himself. Yeah. But it was while... So they had laid out a trap for Locke. Like, they were going to snag him. Yeah. And I would like to point out that my theory from the last one that I was so sure about, about, like, Sabatha being manipulated by the Bonds Magi, could have been true. We don't really know. Because they all got exploded. That's true. <laughs> for, so I think it's probably a pretty good chance that they... I mean, we know they were going to get snagged up. Um, it could have been a trap, um, but I guess we will never know. It doesn't they sound all... like they, it needed to be a trap, though. Right, right, yeah. They can pretty so, much do whatever they want. Yeah. Including blow each other up. Right. So um, So Patience took out the other faction of mages. Yes. Just whoosh, blew them all up. Yes, and she has one Crazy. more. She wants to. She specifically says she wants to talk to Locke one more time. Before she ties up her last loose end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Which, that's chapter 12, right? When she talks to Locke? Yes. So she goes so, and talks to Locke. Um, she gets to Sabbath first, which we don't get to see that conversation. Sabbath is just no. gone. Because she's brought a painting. I have a bone to pick about that whole thing. I but do too. Continue. Um, and she tells Locke, basically, that we have decided there's something moving... It's older than us, and we need to keep magic quiet in order for magic to survive. So we are going into a quiet time, and you are never going to hear from the Bonds Magi again. And, I mean, you're basically, you're a, ma you're a Bonds Magi, but you're not a Bonds Magi, so do whatever you want, but we're leaving. <laughs> and we're also not right. helping you leave. you got to figure that out on your own, even though we promised you. And, well, she, it was a little more knife twisty than that. Yes. She I, I'm giving a very pretty, condensed version. Yeah. She was pretty sadistic about it because mm -hmm. she she was like, basically, she brought a painting mm -hmm. to show Sabatha to freak her out. Mm -hmm. And then after that happens, Sabatha leaves, whatever. Well, I want to talk about that. But she also um, tells Locke, yeah, that's, that's the torture. You're never going to know if what I told you was true or not. You're never going to know. Mm -hmm. I um, want you to be I'm uncomfortable gonna... forever. Yeah. I want you to just, like, wiggle and writhe in uncertainty for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to know where you came from or whether or not what I told you was true, and it's going to eat away at your brain. And she gave him this ominous prophecy mm. about... Mm -hmm. um, was it three... I can pull it up. A crown, three rings, and the death of a child? So, a key, a crown, and a child. Mm, right. Three things you must gain and lose, right? Right. Before he dies or something. So yeah, it's just this ominous prophecy, and then she leaves. And the painting that she showed Sabatha was just a painting of this other Lamour dude with his wife who has red hair. And well, so she tells Locke it's a striking resemblance. So I'm thinking when he looks at it, it's going to look like him. But it doesn't. It doesn't look anything like him. It's just that this lady has red hair that looks like Sabbath's. And that apparently freaks Sabbath out again. Which, like, I'm sorry, it doesn't make sense. Because she already knew that this person that was supposedly Locke had a wife with red hair. She didn't gain any new information. No. It's just a painting. A painting that could have come from anywhere. Right. That painting could be fake. She's a Bonds Magi. Like, use right. your head. Why right. are you freaked out about this? Now, granted, like, we don't know the actual conversation. We just know that's the painting. True. So it could be that that wasn't... She didn't even show her the painting. It could just be that yeah. that's what she told Locke. So that Locke thinks it's the red hair. But... Yeah. What a weird... It doesn't make sense. As I mean, stands. she knows Sabbath's true name. She can make Sabbath do whatever she wants. She, right. could, she could have just said, hey, get out of here. Never never forget about Locke Lamore and leave. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. uh, 
so who knows what actually happened. But if if it is, and Patience is by no means a reliable like no. person, uh, so we have no reason to believe her. But if it happened the way Patience said it happened, that's so stupid. Yeah. And I think Locke should see through it. Um, mm-hmm. I don't and mind then, at all. And then Jean is like, after Patience leaves, Jean goes, do you want to go after Sabatha? Like, she only has 30 minutes on us at most. And Locke's Locke is true to his word in the letter he mm-hmm. wrote her and says that no, he said he would honor her choice. And if she wants to come back to him, she will. But yeah. he is not going to chase after her, which is very honorable. Very grown up of him. But also. <laughs> stupid. <laughs> stupid. <laughs> stupid because patience is stupid. <laughs> the character, yeah. not like the act of yeah. being patient. But um, So that's that. I, I don't buy the whole red hair painting thing. I think that's stupid. Yeah. And if that's if that's true. That's dumb. Oh, and um, Patience also revealed that she 100% holds a grudge against Locke as a mother. Not as a Bonds Mage, but as yeah. a mother, she was manipulating him to harm him. I mean, him. they mutilated her child. Yeah. <laughs> it checks out. Well, okay. So then, in the epilogue, though... Well, hold well, on. They, she talks to the Falconer. Yes. So in the epilogue, okay, we learned so much more about the Falconer. Did we know in book one that the Falconer was, like, putting himself in the brain of his falcon? Yes, because when the falcon was killed, it sent him into a really bad place. Okay. I Um, had forgotten that, that we knew that. So I was like, oh, my gosh. But we find out that it's a bit more sinister and that it's frowned upon. Because these little creatures have little minds. And, mm-hmm. like, they don't... Like, it's it's not fair to them for, like, a Bonds Magi to put their consciousness into an animal like that. And Patience warned him about it. Yeah. Like, but it was not cool. Yeah. And the big reveal that... So he, like, does this spell on himself when, like, an, when something happens to an animal when he's in its brain... Or in its Mm -hmm. mind Mm -hmm. to like dull the pain. So he tried to dull the pain when his falcon was killed. But that act, whatever that magic word was, Patience had put a spell on top of so that if he did that spell, he would go into oblivion. (laughs) Yeah, so she sabotaged him. Yeah, she, yeah. But she she had apparently warned him. Did he just not believe her? I don't know. All I can say is they sure are blaming Locke Lamour for a lot of baloney mm-hmm. that was between the two of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah. I don't think it's totally fair, but. Oh, no way. No way. It's not. But so. yeah, that I remember reading that and being like, wait, are you kidding me? You sabotaged your own son and you're and you held a grudge against the Locke just because Locke defended himself. And. Right. Like, get out of here. That's like, so I mean, stupid. Locke did thoroughly brutal like brutalized the falconer as far as like removing his hands and his tongue but well look at the stuff the falconer did in the first book right he did some i mean they killed bug and the sansas right you know yeah cut off his fingers (laughs) yeah goodbye tongue (sighs) um but anyway so they they they're speaking telepathically to each other which Mm -hmm. i thought was interesting Mm -hmm. um because he hadn't been able to do that with anybody. Yeah. And he, he kind of comes back um, yeah. she wakes to his him senses. Up. Yeah. She releases the spell. And uh, then he's back. The falconer's back, baby. And she leaves him thinking that that's it. She has a little caretaker for him. He's never going to do magic again. He can't use his fingers or his tongue. So, like, that's it. He's, he's I mean, an invalid. she offers to kill him, like, the rest of his faction, if that's what he would prefer. And then she says, if you don't want that, I have this caretaker for you. And he's like, I don't want either of those things. I don't want your caretaker, and I don't want your death. I don't want your mercy. I don't want your pity. Get out of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And he uses the creepy, the creepy liquid silver stuff to, like, make himself a new tongue. And new and hands. And new fingers. That is so trippy. It he's was so like, gross. Um, what does it remind me of? It, it, it kind of reminded me of, like... 
Terminator 2, the Terminator robot is like that, where he's all, like, silvery and liquidy and I haven't seen Terminator goopy. 2. But also, like, um, like Silver Surfer. I don't know. It was mm-hmm. this weird... <laughs> It's so weird, but now he can speak, and his his voice sounds all like robot-y and metallic-y. <laughs> and he killed the caretaker, which made me mad. But he's and he's, he's bad. He is and bad dude. He's bad. He's back, and he killed patients with his birds. Yeah. Yep. Oh snap! I did not expect that. That reminded me of the movie We're Back, which is do you remember that movie? It's the one with the dinosaurs. And they, like, end up going in a parade pretending to be balloons. Oh, and yeah. And there's, like, the blood contract. And the one guy gets eaten by all the crows that he's... Until it's just his eye left. Ugh. And then the crow gets his eye. Do you remember that? Vaguely. Yeah. Uh, it's been a long a time. Um, but, yeah, it was like that. Except that they took her eyes first. That's Ugh. gross. Yeah. The whole... I mean, like, the beginning of the Pirates of the second Pirates of the Caribbean movie when the guy's in the cage and the crows mm-hmm. are, like, mm-hmm. going at him. It reminded me of that. But, I mean, she got she got some magic off to to kill a lot of the crows, but, mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's a whole murder, murder of crows. Mm-hmm. It was, like, 150 um, of them or something. Like, an obscene yeah. amount of crows. And he... Okay, but Ugh. also, she's talking about, like, the things that... Patients mentioned the things that the falconer was researching were too dangerous. And not I don't think it was talking about the animals, though. I think it was something to do with the Eldrin. Because then he, like the very end of the prologue, he has like a moment of being like, he, they're, the Bonds Major are going to wish. Or they're not going to have any quiet. And he's going to figure out what the deal with the Eldrin was. Yeah. Um, whatever that... The, whatever the creepy thing is that they're trying to hide from, I have a feeling he's going to blow the lid off of that. And, mm-hmm. um, Ukatoa. Ukatoa. <laughs> it's Cthulhu. <laughs> um, man, I'm so intrigued. And he's such a creepy villain. And yeah. now he's he was such a formidable foe in the first book. Mm-hmm. Now I'm like, you're back and you're even more broken and evil than before. And now you've got metal fingers and a metal tongue. You are such a super villain. Like, good job. You've, you've, you've got your super villain origin story before you were just like the bad guy mercenary. Yeah. But now you're like legit super villain status. So yeah. good job. Yeah. Falconer. Yeah. Man. Okay. So that's the ending of the book. Mm-hmm. So we have things to talk about the book as a whole. Yes. You mentioned that you want to talk about the short chapters at the end here. It's just a pattern that, <laughs> I mean, the last book was this way. I don't recall, the, it's been a while since we read the first book, so I don't remember it as fresh. But, man, just the endings feel so rushed to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I love, I, let me be clear. I loved the book. Mm-hmm. I love this world. Um, I love the characters so much. Mm-hmm. And the plot works, mostly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like the things we've already talked about that we've complained about, but, or, or I should say had critiques about, Yeah, you know, I think they were valid critiques. And I don't think we were over complaining. I think we were, no, no, no. Making right. Valid I agree. Comments. For sure. For sure. But my guy, this, this, the ending, like the interlude that we got was so short at the end. Yeah. I wanted to know what happened to Mon Crane. I wanted to know what changes reaction was. The, um, the last few chapters were so short. Like, Mm -hmm. the epilogue, I don't think I would change anything about the epilogue. The epilogue was pretty perfect. Yes, agreed. That was incredible. I have suspicions that the epilogue was written well before the epilogue was written. A (laughs) while ago. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, He knew he wanted the Falconer to come back, and Mm -hmm. so, like, he had written that scene right after he (laughs) wrote the first book. Yeah. Um, But, anyway. But, man, like, I wanted... The the whole thing with all of the, the mages of the other faction getting blown up happened so fast, and it didn't feel like it was really... To me, it didn't feel like it was really earned, and it kind of fell flat for me. Yeah. It just seemed really anticlimactic. Yeah, I, like, I was mostly like, wait, what is what is happening right now? Like, I had to read it a couple of times before I was like, oh, that I did read that correctly the first time. Hmm. Then what was it all yeah. for? 
Yeah, she just went to scorched earth on the other faction, and yeah, they like they like destroyed the wizard tower, and yeah, it was basically like the the presence is leaving, and we're you're never gonna see us again, and all this stuff. It's just like what, <sighs> what? <laughs> why did you do this? Why not just? I mean, or like, why go through the election? Why not just? Couldn't you have done this a while ago? Yeah. And I mean the the like explanation in the book is that they needed a cover, but why did they need a cover? They're bonds magi. They can do whatever they want. And like, I get that she was really like as a mother resentful towards Locke, so maybe that's why she roped them into this election to get them closer, so she can mess with them. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe there is some truth to the whole Lamore thing. You know, maybe that's yeah. why maybe. she brought them in. Uh, we don't know, but it just, the whole just blowing everyone up seemed, like I said, it was it was kind of anticlimactic for me. And not only did they blow them up, but they made it so that the people that were left were, like, Jean and Locke and Sabatha were going to be distant memories. Like, they also messed with the people that were left behind so that they wouldn't remember things mm-hmm. accurately. Yeah. Yeah. So poor Nicaros and all of his little anxiety, drug-addled brain. <laughs> yeah. And the thing that gets me, this book is shorter than the last one. Like, you can just, you can see it when you hold them up next to each other. This book is shorter than the last one. Is it? So, like, I feel like we had... They look about the same in my copies, but... Oh. Mine, I could have sworn that the second one, I think, was the longest one. But... Maybe the first one is. I don't know. I feel like no, not the first I, one. I just I feel like there was definitely some more breathing room for the ending where we we sh- like there was wiggle room that wasn't used that could have been used. Like we could have expanded on some things more. And I, yeah. I feel like I remember the pacing of the first book being a little better. Agreed. Which is fairly yeah. typical of first novels. They get a little extra attention because they're first novels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, that's not totally unexpected, but gosh, I would have loved to have a little chunkier ending yeah. here. I would have I would have loved a little more falling action for Jean, Locke, and Sabatha before Sabatha is just, like, whisked away again. I would have loved to have actually seen the conversation between Patience and Sabatha so that, like, we as the readers could know what really happened. Mm-hmm. And then we would know if Patience was telling the truth or not. Like, there, there is, like, there is a time and a place to let the readers in on the secrets. So that they yeah. can be like, oh, why are you falling for this lie? Or, dang, yeah. she's being brutally honest in this moment about and what And it would have given us, uh, it could have given us a really cool opportunity to have another um, Sabbath of POV. Which yeah, was, which was really, great. Really, was, one of my favorite parts of this book was the Sabbath of POV. Yeah. Um, and we could have had that again mm-hmm. in that last chapter. If it would have just taken one more section, just right. add one more section right. of Sabbath and patience. Three more pages, maybe, maybe six, depending on how much they talked. We never learned what the stakes were for Sabbath, why she was so convinced that she had to win. Right. Like we never learned any of that there. So the ending was too brief. It was too abrupt for me. Mm-hmm. I think we should have expanded on some more things and like mm-hmm. answered a few more questions because they're questions that I wanted the answers to, but that now they don't feel necessary. So I know we're not going to know like, right. Right. The election's over. It was a tie. She has no reason to really talk about why she felt like she had to win. Plus her employers, the other faction of the, the mages got blown up. So like there's real, there's literally right. no reason for, for us to know anymore. But I still want to know. Right. I would have liked to know. And the Falconer is still around, but he wasn't cognizant through that whole time period, so he doesn't know. Right. He has no idea. Right. Um. So that is a critique. I think that the ending was far too brief. Yeah. Um, it could have. It could have been several more chapters. Like I was expecting, if if I didn't know when the finish line was and I couldn't visibly see it as I'm turning the pages. I would have expected like Locke to get captured and for them to have to do some kind of um, rescue operation to try to get Locke back from the mages. Right. Um, Which I could see how that would have felt 
a little long. Like I could see but how like, like having that that would have felt like a second ending. But I mean, but, the election is supposed to be like the climax, right? The true. So, the election happens. It goes the same way. We can say, and then he gets captured. I I would lump all that in as like the climax, mm-hmm. but the climax was really really abrupt with everyone just blowing up, and little very 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 minimal falling action. So, right. Yeah, that's my thought. Yeah. I agree completely. So what's um, something, anything you've got? Okay. Well, we talked about this a little bit last week. Um, Like we recorded a conversation about it and then we chose to edit it out and save it for this week. Um, Yeah, because that episode last week was getting really, really really long. long. Um, And I feel like it's a, it's a thing to bring up for the whole, like, like part of our overall thoughts on the book. Um, For sure. So when we were in the flashbacks in the interludes, um, mm-hmm. Janora and her aunt and a few others, Moncrane, I think as well, were referred to as Nightskins, which I didn't pick up on the first couple times it happened. And then I was like, wait, why are they calling them Nightskins? Why aren't they just like calling them black? Um... And then also, why is that bothering me? Like, those were all the questions I was having. Mm-hmm. Um, and in our conversation, the the question of how did they handle Drakasha in the Red Seas Under Red Skies book, because she was also black, mm-hmm. came up. And so I looked that up, and this is how she was described. So I just want to use this as a juxtaposition to how black people were described in The Republic of Thieves. Yeah. Okay. Um, this woman was taller than the one called Esri and broader across her shoulders. She was dark with skin, just a few shades lighter than the whole of her ship. And she was striking, but not young. Um, and then goes on to describe her, um, like braided hair, her age, like (laughs) she's got wrinkles, um, and her night colored braids threaded with red and silver ribbons hung in a mane beneath a wide four cornered cap. So, which is funny because I had originally pictured her like when, even though I read that and I picked up on that she was black, um, for whatever reason, I did not picture the braids at all through the whole book. I, I was picturing mm-hmm. her as having like very short to no hair for some reason. Yeah. Um, but okay. So we have that, like a very beautiful description of someone with black skin yeah. and, and it says like that it's black. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, which like I've seen a lot of discourse on TikTok and in other places like in school and like in my grad school program um, where the conversation is being had if you have and this happens in fantasy a lot that fantasy writers specifically white fantasy writers will want to be diverse mm-hmm. but they're trying to straddle a line where they don't come out and say that characters are black or people of color and they use other terms to kind of cushion it so that if white people that don't want diversity in fantasy read it, they won't necessarily catch it. Um, and so I wondered if night skins as a term falls under that criticism of don't say that they had like, um, olive colored skin or, or tawny or these words that like mean brown, but like what kind, like they're, yeah. they're fairly ambiguous terms. I think night skin is less ambiguous than saying that someone has tawny skin, but cause I think, I feel like a lot of people wouldn't, would read the word tawny and not know what it means. Right. Or like when I read <laughs> that someone has tawny skin, I think of someone who's like been out in the sun a lot. Like, that's what I mm-hmm. think of as someone who's just, like, very tan and got kind of that, like, you know, that, ooh, you should have wore sunscreen look. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, your skin is leather. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah. So, I I just wanted to make that observation that I think that that is a misstep for Scott Lynch. I think he described Drakasha really beautifully in Red mm-hmm. Seas Under Red Skies. Um 
And I wish he would have taken the same approach in the Republic of Thieves instead of just saying that they were night skins. Because, like, that feels very weird. Yeah. Yeah. A, a few things strike me um, having this conversation. Um, not to, like, play devil's advocate, but I'm just... No. So... I'm I'm just thinking like things are striking me as you're as you're talking. So one thing that just now hit me, one of them takes place in a flashback and the other is them as adults. I'm True. Could be maybe some character growth has happened since <laughs> um since the flashback. Yeah. Um, but I wish that then he would have said like he could have added commentary and saying like Right. He could have said like when they described Drakasha, they could have said like, oh, you know, they used to be described as night skins, but blah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I think I don't think that's the case. In I, I don't think if that if you if they went that route, I don't think that was originally the case, and I I think that would be kind of like a shoehorned way of like yeah trying to fix it, like retcon it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's possible. It's a possible retcon that could be made. Maybe if you want to headcanon it. It's just but also, weird that the, the first book where there was black people, it was handled well. And the second book, right. the third book, it was not. <laughs> I think that... So I also have like questions about if it was intentional to describe her, the, Drakasha, that way and these other black people as night skins in the next one. Like if, if he made a conscious deliberation to do that... I'm like, so what's, is there like a world building ex- explanation or since you didn't call Drakasha a night skin are, are not all black people in this universe described as night skins? Like, is it only certain black people? Um, yeah. Like, like we don't know, I guess, but I mean, it could be, um, I mean, we yeah, know it, that... it was odd. Yeah. It was definitely odd. And yeah. Was it, is it a term, we also don't know, like, the social context of it in the world. Right. Of, like, is this a term that they gave themselves, or is this a term that they were given by people who were oppressing them? We also don't right. know the history behind the term in the world right. building. Is it a derogatory but, term? And I don't think there's enough context clues for us to really know right now, mm-hmm. but given the world that we live in <laughs> right. i totally understand because you know for the same reason that calling someone who has native blood a red skin would mm. um make you uncomfortable yeah. right yeah um for the same reason so i totally understand how that would make well how that made you uncomfortable and how that would make someone uncomfortable um when i was reading it i f- i feel like i immediately knew like oh they're they're black um and that's just what i guess that's what they call black people I guess I didn't really think much of it at the time, but yeah, sure. now that now that you mention it, that is odd, especially juxtaposed against the d- description of Captain Drakasha in the second book. Mm-hmm. Like why the why the why the distinction there? Yeah, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe there's a. I'm just saying, maybe there's a world building explanation for it. Maybe not all black people are described as night skins. Maybe it's a certain sect of black people. Maybe they have. I don't. I don't know. We don't know. But you know what. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, okay, so while I was looking up that bit about Drakasha, just because I wanted mm-hmm. to see how she was described, I did find a little line in Red Seas Under Red Skies where Locke makes a jab at Jean about knowing more about, like, he's talking about Drakasha, and he says something like, well, you would know more about someone like her than I would. Wow. Yeah. Deep cut. Yeah. That's hilarious. Right. Which is also like kind of misogynistic and gross, but an interesting allusion to something that we didn't know had happened yet. Exactly. It's just, it's funny. Mm -hmm. It's funny when you can go back and do a reread and catch. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, you did have that planned out when you wrote. (laughs) Yeah. Right. So now I'm kind of curious to go back. I'm not going to, I have too many other books, but I would be curious to go back and reread The Lies of Mm Locke Lamora and see... Like, with the falconer parts. Like, if some things make more sense, or... 
Yeah, I would be illusions. really fascinated. Yeah. Yeah, I would be very fascinated to reread the first book specifically mm-hmm. with the, the, the Falconer stuff, like you said. Mm-hmm. I'd be really curious. We um, still have unanswered questions from the Red Seas Under the Red Skies about the one chick that, like, disappeared. Huh. Yeah, you're right. Oh, my goodness. So, so we knew that not all questions would be answered because we mm-hmm. knew he fully intended for there to be another book, as right. we can see in the afterword of the right. book. Um uh, this concludes the third volume in the Gentleman Bastard sequence, which will continue with the Thorn of Emberlane. So there was supposed to be a, a fourth one. Um, however, this was like 2013 or something when this one was published. So yeah, we're coming on um, 10 years here. So it's been a good decade. Although I know Scott Lynch has become more active online with like his blog and stuff, and that he has been more active in like updating his community. Um, so I, I feel like it's going to happen. Anyway, all that to say, he definitely intended to write a fourth book, and I hope he still does. Um, it's still forthcoming. All... Yes. So. <laughs> forthcoming. Because it's the fourth book. <laughs> no, just because that's a word used to describe Pun intended. Oh, okay. But... Um, anyway, no, so you. I really hope he writes a fourth one. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'm very curious. Yeah. You know, the race thing, we, we also briefly touched on that um, when we read The Blade Itself with the pinks, which is also kind of like a weird thing. Oh, yeah, because Pharaoh describes white people as, as pinks. pinks. And yeah. I will say, the way the way that she used it was a million percent derogatory. Oh, yeah. Because she <laughs> and hates she con- white people. <laughs> and she continues to use it for the whole series. And I don't doubt um, it. It's a character flaw that she most certainly possesses. Um, yeah. She is certainly, certainly racist. But it's unique to see it flipped yes <laughs> you, you know almost one would say refreshing to see it flipped <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't even really be mad at it at the time um I'm, yeah. I, at the time that makes it sound like i am now i'm not mad at it um, but you finished it was, the books, just, so. it was just interesting yeah um i don't think that Locke and jean were using night skins no. intentionally derogatory no 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 i don't um, either um and yeah. i yeah, yeah. I, I just think we're missing some context that I think would have helped explain mm-hmm. the use of the term and what it means. And I don't think that Scott Lynch was intentionally racist. <laughs> um, right. In, I mean, in using that verbiage, maybe, maybe we all it was have just internal a, biases. Yeah. It might have just been an oops. Um, right. Or maybe and there is a world building explanation. Anyway. It's just like the other fantasy authors that are guilty of the same thing. Like, it's not coming, it's not like they're intentionally trying to be racist. They think they're being inclusive, but they're doing it in a way so as to not offend other white people. And that's where the problem lies. Um, yeah. And so, like, it's it's part of the system. That's a, I mean, the system is the problem, right? But um, I I don't know if I would be convinced that he was doing it, Scott Lynch, that Scott Lynch was doing it to not offend other white people, or if no, I if completely it was... agree. Okay, okay, good. I was like, no, I don't think that was. No, no, I don't no. think that was it. I think he was just. It, to me, it read as just him trying to find a creative, fantastical way to refer to this group of people. Yes, I um, completely agree with that. Okay. Um, my my comment was more to the like general like criticism okay. that's being levied cool. against white fantasy writers, not saying that someone's skin is black, and instead saying that their skin is like amber colored. Why are you just, saying like, orange. amber? Yeah. yeah. Um. Why are you saying my skin is chocolatey? Right, exactly. <laughs> Why describe it like food yeah. when you could just say that it's brown? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's what I was talking about. Okay, okay. Not, not cool. Scott Lynch. I was talking more about the, like, the criticism in general and how that is a problem with the system of us trying to like be diverse mm-hmm. for the sake of being diverse but not like actually want people of color in the world. And I think that Scott Lynch, like, I, I again, the way he described Drakasha. Oh yeah. Top tier. Girl boss. I love, love her. Um, I hope that when the series continues, she comes back around eventually. Oh yeah. Cause I love it's, her. Yeah. And it, it is clear to me that he wants people of color in his work. Yes. And that he has an appreciation for people of different cultures mm-hmm. and it's not like his books are not whitewashed and just full of a bunch of white right. people, which is exactly. really cool. Um, so yeah, we're not, we're definitely not saying that Scott Lynch is, right. you know, guilty just, of certain things. But. Exactly. I just think that the use of night skins was an odd choice. Yeah. 
And I would have liked more of an explanation. Yes, I agree. Okay. Um, What did, so what, give me one of your favorite things about this one. Um, Well, I love that we got more, like, Sabatha wasn't just, like, this figment of Locke's past anymore. I love that we actually got to see her in the past and we got to see her in the present and, like, learn to appreciate her the same way that Locke and Jean do. Mm -hmm. Um, And I loved the Sabatha and Jean moments. And I wanted Mm -hmm. ten times more of that. Yeah. Like, I wanted more of the platonic... Like, she loves John like a brother, and they are, like, on each other's side. Mm-hmm. I wanted more of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's a chance she'll get more of it. Yeah, that's true. For sure. But I, I would love agree those moments. With, yeah, yeah, I would agree. I also love those moments. Really, I think Sabbath has stole the show in this one. Mm-hmm. I mean, it had been such a big build-up to meeting her character mm-hmm. throughout the last two books. She was, like you said, treated as this, uh, this like... Uh, phantasma like this Mm -hmm. um this figment figment of Locke's imagination that we've never actually seen Mm -hmm. um we were even talking about like is she even alive like is she is she dead did she die in some kind of like tragic way and that's why he won't talk about her um so there was so much mystery and intrigue surrounding this character that when we finally did get to meet her it was so it was so cool to see um the the myth, the legend. Yeah. Um, that was Sabatha. Yeah. Well, and even in the flashbacks in the first and second book, she was never in those either. Even then she was like, she was always away. She was always doing something else. She wasn't part of the yeah. like memories that were being recounted, which mm-hmm. I think that that could be why the ending fell flat because we didn't get to see her reaction. Like it felt like her autonomy was stolen from her at the very end. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I agree. And also, it, it just seemed like too much of a reset to the baseline, which is mm-hmm. just Locke and Jean doing what Locke and Jean do. You know, it seemed like it was yeah. too much of a hard reset back to that, mm-hmm. where, like, why why can't Sabatha be in the group now? Why can't it be a trio? Like, right. why, why not? I, I see no good reason. Because the red hair doesn't cut it, <laughs> uh, right. the red hair painting doesn't cut it for a good reason. So that, like, right. in my head, patience had to have done something else. But anyway, like um, if there could have been any, like any evidence that actually like makes her story more valid besides the red hair, like a picture yeah. of the other, or like if if Locke had the same eyes as the other guy. Like if there was any resemblance between the man and the painting, yeah. even that could have been fabricated. So like yeah. the painting doesn't cut it. No. And the no. red hair, which was already mentioned, doesn't cut it. Like no. if you wanted the red hair to be the like thing that s- sticks out to her, don't mention it earlier. Just say that he had a yeah. wife. And then, um, and then reveal the red hair towards the end. Yeah, that's. I agree. I think that you shouldn't have mentioned the whole red hair thing in the previous conversation mm-hmm. when she interrupted dinner. She should have saved it for the epilogue. Not mm-hmm. the epilogue, sorry. For the chapter 12. Chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, that would have been more impactful and made more sense. Mm-hmm. Because it was like she already had this kind of freak out and, and runaway moment right. because of the red hair. And right. now she's doing it again. So it doesn't make sense to us. Right. Anyway, um, we were talking about things we liked. So... <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Well, we were um, talking about Sabatha and how she felt. It felt like she was cheated in the end. So basically, more Sabatha. That's mm-hmm. what I want in the future books. I hope that mm-hmm. she um, doesn't get sidelined for like several books mm-hmm. after this, and that we do get to see more of her, and that they do come back together in the near future. Um, because man, her character is so cool. Like so cool. I really enjoyed. I really, really enjoyed her POV. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, it was so section. poetic. Yeah. It was amazing. Great Great time. And I love, I do really love the dynamic between Jean and Sabatha as well. So. Yeah. I liked that we got more Jean POV in this book. Oh yeah. And I want more of that too. Um, I think I really, really like how the Falconer has been set up as this dastardly villain for the future books. I think that he is going to make such a compelling bad guy for the gentleman bastards that, Um, I am looking forward to that a lot, reading about his, uh, machinations and his, his plans to, uh, thwart the boys. 
Um, he was like making my skin crawl. That epilogue, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm wigging out. When he was when he was figuring out how to use the the dream steel, is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Uh, as as his fingers, I was like, oh no, this guy's gonna. He just he just figured out magical prosthetics. Yeah, <laughs> and he, did. he is going to be able to use magic again. Here we go. Let's buckle up, y'all. And now because... he has a focus. Like they even describe yeah. it as being a focus. Yeah. Uh, it's the Falconer's world, and he is flying wherever he wants. <laughs> Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. A murder of crows, as it were. <sighs> yes. Maybe the grossest death scene we've had in this whole series. Oh, I. Wait, no. Nazca don't was know. drowned in horse pee in the first yeah, one. Yeah, that was bad. I think that one might take the cake for the grossest. Yeah. Um, thrown in a barrel of horse pee and then drowned. Yeah. That's the worst. Yeah. But I'm gonna give the murder and of Esri- crows. Oh no, you're right. Yeah, there's been I some really, out. <laughs> really brutal death scenes. Um, so. this one's up there though. It might be top mm-hmm. five or three. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. we ha- in the first book we had the guy that was the torturer. <sighs> Ooh, yeah, I forgot about that guy. Okay, I hope maybe <laughs> someday we get to go back to Kamor too. I miss Kamor. I know, me too. I like Kamora a lot. I like that setting. But yeah, me too. So in, 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 okay, so normally we give them a rating, right? Mm-hmm. Do we do out of five? I think so. Are we, are we good reading this thing? Okay. So what's your, what's your five out of five stars? What do you give it? Mm, I'm going to go with four. Yeah. Cause the yeah. ending. And yeah. there was a lot of the like political stuff that I was just like, I don't, I don't care. I would have, I would have rather, sacrifice some of the political stuff in the beginning to get more of an ending. Yes. I agree. I think it had it had a pretty slow wind up and a mm-hmm. really quick finish. Mm-hmm. Um the pacing I think needed work, which is why I think I would also give it a 4. I don't remember what I rated the other ones I don't to either. be honest, but I think I would give this one a 4. Um yeah. for all the reasons we said, the ending. Um I I still really, really liked it a lot. Oh, um, yeah. I don't think of of the three. I think the first one is still my favorite, mm-hmm. um, because that's just the way these things typically go. But, um, but I did really like Sabatha. But I ha- I feel like I'm walking out of this book with way more questions. Right. Yeah. Um, if it weren't for Sabatha, this book would not be nearly as good as it is. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, I think I think four is fair, and I agree. Okay. I'm gonna give it the same. Fair. Yeah, well, man. hopefully the fourth one comes out soon, and we can do it on the podcast. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, I'm gonna have to look up his blog and kind of follow along and see what the because yeah. I know he was also gonna do some short stories with Locke and Jean, mm. so I have to look those up too. Yeah. But yeah, well, it's been fun, gentlemen, bastards. We've read it all now. Yep. We're caught up. Yep. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. But excited to move on to other things. Yes. So, um, be looking for the reading schedule for A Magic Steeped in Poison. Mm-hmm. That'll be coming up shortly. Cool, cool. I'll be posted on all the socials, all the places. Yep. Hopefully this one doesn't have any weird intersects and interludes that make it confusing. No, chapters. Just, just good old chapters. It's a YA book, so it's a little simpler that way. Oh, okay. Cool. And not like the, what one, which one was it that didn't even have chapter titles? It was just breaks. Um, a light, a light of the midnight stars. <laughs> oh, oh, that one was complicated. It was. Oh. It was really complicated. That one was so complicated. None of, that. none of that. Okay. Cool. Well, um, I guess we can wrap it up. Mm-hmm. So I guess until next time, hold on. What's the thing that they say? What's the thing that the gentleman bastards say? Um, I want to know. Hold on. I found it. Okay. Um, To us, the richer and cleverer than everyone else. That's what they say. I love it. The richer and cleverer than everyone else. Which, you know, they live up to it. So it's been good. It has been. So, until next time, uh, go read the next book. A Magic Secret Poison. And we'll talk to you next time. Later. Bye.